You're listening to Let's Talk Creation, the science podcast that's just for you with Paul Gardner and Todd Wood. All right, welcome back to Let's Talk Creation with Todd and Paul. I'm Todd Wood. And I'm Paul Garner. And today uh, we're finishing up, uh, well, I don't know that we're finishing. Maybe we will. Maybe we won't. We'll see how it goes. Uh, the geologic column. Um, so the last episode, we planned just one episode, but boy, we got into it. And uh, there's a lot of detail here. A lot to talk about. A lot to try to understand. When we left off, we were talking about uh, exceptions to the rules. So I mm. mentioned a guy named George McCready Price who is a creationist of some a reputation. People, I think a lot of people know Price um, still. And there is uh, a lot of knowledge about his sort of central claim that there is no geologic column. Price concluded from that that the order is bogus. The order is made up. It's just, you know, imposed on the on the, the fossil record, the geologic record, in order to prop up evolution or some such. And then it wasn't it wasn't a real pattern. So you said at the very end of last uh, episode that the order was that these sorts of exceptions that Price was looking at were only found, or were generally found, let's say generally found, in mountain ranges. Uh, and you were talking about, what, folding and thrusting? What, what, what? Can you, can you give us a little more detail on what that means? Because that's way beyond <laughs> my experience of rock layers. My experience of rock layers, they just sort of sit there. Sometimes they might fall down on the edge of a cliff, but they're not moving much. So what's the deal with this? So I, I describe mountain belts as kind of like locations of car wrecks. Right. So mount, mountain belts are linear features that tend to um, occur at the boundaries of tectonic plates. So where tectonic plates have uh, collided, you get... Uh, mountain building going on. You get um, compression of the crust where the two plates have come together, a bit like, you know, two cars. If they come together in a car wreck, they get compressed, right? You know? Sure. Um, and, uh, and sometimes entire um, blocks of rock can be thrust over top of other rocks or can slide uh, catastrophically down um, over top of other rocks. So that's basically, you know, the, the, the tectonic forces are a kind of unimaginable. And in fact, again, I think if we deny that these uh, kinds of events have occurred, again, it's kind of we're shooting ourselves in the foot here because we have a model in which there is enormous tectonic catastrophism going on during the during the flood and in the immediate aftermath of the flood. And so I think we have a model that can help us to explain how these kinds of things could happen. Because imagine, you know, you, you have to slide this enormous block of rock that might be, I don't know, you know, thousands of feet thick, uh, maybe more, and uh, even kilometers in scale over top of other rocks. How do you do that slowly? <laughs> um, one thing that you do, we think, have to do is kind of hydraulically jack up the, the overriding block. Uh, you, you need some kind of, uh, you know, hy hydraulic um, jacking system whereby this, otherwise, you know, the friction just causes these two blocks of rock just to kind of grind to a halt so they've got to be fluids along the along the plane at which they're moving that allows um, that frictional force to be overcome so that that block can override the other block the trouble with that is that as soon as you have any kind of fracturing that relieves releases that 
that those hydraulic um, pressures, the movement grinds to a halt. Right. So I, I think the only way you can do it is to do it catastrophically and to do it fast. Um, so I think, you know, dur during the kind of um, tectonic upheavals during the flood, when mountains are being formed in days rather than over millions of years, we have the kinds of geological conditions and circumstances where this kind of catastrophic displacement of huge lithosphere, lithospheric blocks can happen. So and I think we, you know, we, we, you, you have to envisage some kind of crazy yeah. conditions like that in order to explain how these things happen. Yeah, so recently my wife and I have been doing a little excavating on our property, moving some dirt around, and, and you find we find these big rocks, because we live in Tennessee and there's rocks everywhere. And, you know, and I'm talking big. I'm talking maybe slightly larger than my head. And you, we can, you know, you, they're heavy. Rock is heavy. Rock does not just move. So you're talking about with with the kind of the layers and the kind of movements that you're describing. This is this is massive amount of energy. This is massive amount of pressure and movement on a scale that I think. Oh, I can't even. I don't. I can't. I don't know how to imagine it. It's so gigantic. Um, and yet, the geological evidence is that that is exactly what's happened. You know, for all the reasons that I talked about. Right. That we have, we have evidence of the kind of rubble left behind by the movement, and we have evidence of the kind of gouge marks and scratch marks and drag folds. And sometimes, you know, you can then look back in the direction of movement, and you can find the source. Where those, where the overriding block came from, you know, you can match it up with other rocks, you know, tens of kilometers away, somewhere wow. over there, and uh, so you know we have good evidence that these things happened. Um, it's geologists work hard to try and explain, you know, the the exact geological conditions that allowed it to happen, but the evidence that it happened, I think, is extremely strong. So. Essentially, what what I'm hearing here, let me see if I can summarize what you're saying. It, there's two things going on. So one thing going on is that there's this general trend of ordered layering. And that ordered layering we find commonly occurring in many places around the world. And that ordered layering is what we call the column, the geologic column. It is a summary that doesn't work perfectly. It's not everywhere that you find all the layers, but the layers generally follow that order and you find that it works everywhere you go. And we said in the last episode, that seems like a really interesting I mean, it's global, right? It's globally applicable, so that means there must be a global explanation. And we talked a little bit about um, things like the, the, the Permian sandstone, how, how geologists, even conventional geologists, are proposing essentially global ideas to account for how in the world uh, these, these uh, global patterns exist in the, in the, in the column. Which, of course, I think we have an explanation, too, that there was a global flood. Okay, then there are these exceptions, right? And so normally we would look at exceptions and go, uh-oh, uh, this is counter evidence to what we just said, right? So the column exists, but there are these exceptions. Uh, and the exceptions being there are places where the, the layering is out of order. But since those things occur only in mountain or largely in mountain ranges and they are associated with other evidences of massive tectonic movement, the exception actually becomes another evidence yeah. for <laughs> the, the existence of the column and the necessity of a global explanation for how the patterns came to be. So even the exactly. exceptions work yeah, exactly. in favor. Yeah. 
So let me ask this next question here. So sometimes you get these rock layers that move over on top of an, <clears throat> on top of another rock layer. In those cases, let's say so we have say an older chunk on top of a younger chunk. Okay. So within the younger chunk mm. and within the older chunk, does the column still work? Is the is the exception only that contact zone between the older and the younger rock layers? Is that does that make sense? Is that how it sort of works? Yeah, exactly. That that's exactly right. Okay. Um it's not, it's not quite the same as uh, the kind of overthrusting that we've just been talking about, but there is, a, there is a location here on the east coast of England that I've, I've visited where there are huge blocks of the chalk enclosed within glacial sediments. So these are Ice Age sediments. But within the Ice Age sediments, there are these huge rafts or blocks of, of chalk that have been caught up so that the glaciers were kind of like a big... Um, bulldozer, you know, that was kind of just entraining blocks of rock in, in the glacial sediments that it was positive. And when you look within those chalk blocks, you can identify the layering and the stratigraphy and the fossils in the chalk, and you know exactly which part of the chalk those blocks came from. Wow. Like you can match, match them up to, to the you can say, here's where in the chalk stratigraphy those blocks came from. Okay, that's helpful. So when, when, when Price talks about um, any layer found on any other layer, it's not really that simple. Because what you get are really chunks of layers that obey <laughs> the... Uh, that, that obey that fit with the geologic column that have been imposed on other chunks and so that I, it that doesn't mean that you have a totally scrambled layering right where the layers can go any which way you want there's a particular that that would support the idea that there's been movement and there's been thrusting or folding or whatever okay that's that's helpful. That makes some sense to me. Now, there's there's one other argument that um, people who are suspicious of the column have often appealed to, and we probably ought to just talk about it a bit. Okay. And that's the idea that there are um, not whole rock formations out of sequence, but on this in this particular argument, fossils that are not in the right sequence. Uh, kind of misplaced fossils. Okay. And the most famous, I guess, has to be the alleged human tracks, the human footprints in the Paluxy Riverbed in Texas. I was afraid you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> and, <clears throat> uh, you know, this again has been used as an argument uh, against the column to say, look, the fossils are, do not really occur in the order that the column requires. Um, now, <clears throat> I'm sure you're very familiar, Todd, with the, with the Pluxy tracks, but basically these are Cretaceous limestones. Mm -hmm. And uh, for a long time it's been known that various types of dinosaur tracks occur in these limestones exposed in the river. Right. But since the time of the Great Depression, um, claims have also been made that there are fossil human tracks alongside those of the, the dinosaurs. And uh, this has made its way into the creationist literature, and particularly if you read some of the older literature. Uh, it's not the only example of its kind, but it's perhaps the most famous. And I think the problem here, I mean, to take the Paluxy case in particular, is that when people have examined the evidence for the human tracks more closely, the evidence kind of dissolves. So yeah. some of the human tracks are clearly uh, carvings. They were basically, people made them 
Yes. They carve them. They carve them into the rock during the Great Depression to sell Indeed. them to yep. make, make money. Yep. And uh, we know that because when you look at some of those carved tracks, the anatomical details are not correct. Right. And uh, you can section those tracks and yes. find that the layers in the limestone that ought to be depressed underneath right. the footprint. When when the foot went down into the soft sediment, it should have deformed those layers underneath the footprint. But actually, they get truncated against the footprint. Yeah. Which sometimes indicates they're carved that, against the against the layering as well. Yes, yeah, sometimes you can see that and it's carved right into it. So 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 some of them are are, are, are basically fakes. Uh, some some of them are misidentified dinosaur tracks. So theropod dinosaurs, the kind of carnivorous, small carnivorous dinosaurs, would generally walk on their three toes, but sometimes would go down onto the whole foot. Right. Now, when when they walk on their three toes, they leave they leave nice deep toe marks, and you see the three toe marks. But when they were walking on the whole of the foot, the flat of the foot. Often the toe marks were actually quite shallow and the soft mud would kind of cave in and obscure the, the toe marks. And what you'd end up with is a, is a rather elongate um, impression that looks superficially like a very large human uh, foot. But if you look closely at those, very often you can actually still see evidence of the toe marks at the front of the foot and sometimes the staining in the sediments sort of picks out the, the three-toed nature of the track. And then there are other um, claimed human tracks that I think are just, they're, they're nothing of the sort. They're, they're just random erosional marks yeah. on the rock that right. have just been misidentified. So there's a whole host of things going on there. Perhaps. But there's not really good evidence that there are human tracks. And so m the, the main creation organisations kind of left this argument alone a long time ago. Um, you st it still crops up, you know, in the popular literature sometimes and on websites. And stuff. But the main creation organisations, I think, have pretty much agreed that you know, this is yeah. not an argument that we should, we should be using. And it's not the only one. I, I think, Todd, um, maybe I'm putting you on the spot here. But, Put me on the spot. Um, uh, ha haven't haven't you uh, got some information about a Triassic shoe print? Oh yes, the shoe print. Yes. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so... Goodness, the details of the story escape me right now. But, yes, we do have... We do have an, uh, basically an old scrapbook that was made in the, in the first half of the 20th century uh, on these... It, it specifically looking at what was alleged to be a, a shoe print that supposedly had details of the of the stitching and the sole and so forth that were visible uh, in the in this print um, and uh, yeah so there were there were some some uh, micrographs made it was examined under the microscope and it looks like minerals it looks like just a bunch of mineral incrustations and doesn't look anything like a like I would expect a shoe to look uh, yeah, so yeah, these sorts of things have existed for a very long time. And you mentioned the, the, the profiteering aspect. That was, that was common, right? So this is back in the 20s and the 30s. People did not, I mean, today we have, you know, National Geographic specials. We have uh, videos that are accessible on the internet. People have a much, a much better understanding and, of course, with with uh, science and evolution seeping into popular culture as well, people have a much better understanding of what the hypothetical past was like. Whereas in the 20s and 30s, you know, the idea that you could find a, a fossil, a fossil human footprint next to a dinosaur footprint was maybe not that all all that far fetched. Uh, didn't seem crazy at all. Uh, this was before radiometric dating and so forth, and so people, people had the, they were inclined to believe these sorts of sensational claims, and there and there, like you say, there are, there are many of these things, many 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 of these sorts of, uh, uh, fossils or so forth that are supposed to be, in the wrong place. 
And the relevance for our discussion is that basically they're, they're used as evidence that the fossil succession yes. that was identified by those early field geologists doesn't really hold up. There are these right. kinds of exceptions that kind of explode, you know, the evolutionary interpretation. of the fossils. Right. And, and pertinent to that then is the reality that when you go in to look at these things in detail, uh, the evidence just sort of disappears. It, it becomes a case of mistaken identity, uh, sometimes wishful thinking. Uh, and every few years, I still get contacted about some fantastic discovery that's going to destroy evolution because it shows that the fossil record is wrong and, and, and then all these things live together at the same, at the same time. And it usually turns out to be an, a funny shaped rock. Interesting in its own right, but just a funny shaped rock and not anything and, to get excited and I, about. I think, I think there's kind of a broader lesson here, um, you know, regardless of you know, the, the, the merits or otherwise of these kinds of misplaced fossils, which is that, you know, should we be investing our time just looking for these kind of magic bullets that are going right. to bring the whole edifice of evolution crumbling down? Right. Or should we rather be saying, look, there are actually these really interesting patterns in the rock record and in the fossil record. And as creationists, we need to be explaining those rather than just looking for these, you know, these magic bullets. Right. Gonna, that are going to uh, destroy evolution overnight. That isn't how science works. Science doesn't work by looking for these kinds of magic. No. It works by the hard work of um, studying nature, seeing these patterns, and explaining them. That, yep. That's what we need to be doing. As that's exactly right. Which then brings us sort of to this idea of the, of the column as a, as a large-scale pattern that occurs around the world, and we've already said that's that in and of itself. The idea that there would be this this globally useful summary of geology is really odd, given the fact that we live in a geologically diverse world where there are deserts and jungles and erosions happening and deposition is happening and deposition is happening in certain ways, and we would not expect a million years from now to find one single type of rock around the world from where we live now. And then the exceptions also fit into that because they conform to this notion of mountain building and, and tectonic movement, which require these this massive amount of energy, this just unfathomable amount of energy that then leads us to think, well, that would have to be something huge and global maybe that produced these kinds of movements. So I guess the question then is if if you know chasing after these these sort of magic bullet artifacts or fossils that are out of place is kind of not the best use of our resources, well what kind of what kind of research could a creationist do in order to better understand the geologic column and propose sort of a, a catastrophic explanation for it. I guess maybe the, the, the simplest question is, uh, did the flood cause the geologic column? Is that where we start? Yeah. Okay. So we're, we're kind of getting here into into the creationist interpretation of sure. of these yeah. patterns, and I think you know, as creationists, when we um, you know, we read those early chapters of Genesis, it's pretty clear that the flood, uh, as a worldwide event, would have been an event of enormous geological significance, and that we have to think about interpreting the geology of the Earth in the light of the biblical record of the flood, and it would suggest, I think, that uh, there must the, the the geological column must must be uh, able to be divided up into parts that were formed before the flood, perhaps creation week or in the pre-flood world. Uh, a portion of the column that must represent the record of the flood itself, 
and perhaps part of the column that's formed after the flood. That would seem to be a sort of sensible division, given that the flood is this great sort of punctuating event in, in Earth history in the creation model. Now, you know, creationists have therefore tried to identify what are those flood rocks, you know, what, which bit of the geological column represents the flood and which bits represent these other periods of Earth history. And there's lots of debate and discussion. It's one of the liveliest issues in creation geology is to try and identify where those boundaries are in, in the record. And I think it's a complex question, um, partly because the end of the flood, at least, uh, is not likely to have been necessarily sudden or contemporaneous everywhere. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think we should expect that from the biblical record. So it might be quite hard to identify where these boundaries are. But that's one thing that we could do. We could, we could look and say, you know, what would we expect to find if we're looking at the deposits of a global flood? What would we expect to find if we're looking at a world that's recovering from the flood? And where do we see those signatures in the geological record? And I think most creationists, uh, you know, there's, there's obviously, um, you know, wide a variety of opinions, but I think most creationists would say that the Paleozoic and the Mesozoic parts of the column at least are deposits that were formed during the, the global flood. Uh, there are other things that we could do. We could, uh, we could begin to look at the fossil sequences, the fossil successions, and say, can we interpret those from a creationist perspective, if they are not evolutionary sequences, then what are they? We could, uh, for example, uh, use the, uh, the fact that the fossils appear to be buried as whole communities in the flood sediments to it make inferences about the nature of the pre-flood world. Uh, work backwards from the burial of these communities to sort of reconstruct what was the ecology of the pre-flood world. You know, what were the biomes, the broad sort of ecological communities, the animals and plants that made up those biomes. Uh, that's a very helpful thing to do, and some work has already been done in that regard. Uh, Kurt Wise has done some work on reconstructing a hydrothermal biome based on the fossils in the sediments of the late Precambrian and into the earliest part of the Paleozoic. Uh, he's also looked at the plants in the Paleozoic and reconstructed a floating forest uh, biome. Uh, we could, you know, we could expand that work and into into other parts of the column. We could look at the dinosaur communities in the Mesozoic, for example. Uh, and then, of course, we could also look at specific rock units and say, you know, what was going on during the flood that meant that we have these, these uh, cross-bedded sandstones in the Permian? What's happening? What does that re represent in the flood? You know, is that, for example, the point at which the floodwaters are reaching the margins of the land and reworking coastal dune deposits or, you know, or is something else going on? You know, there, there are questions like this. What, what was going on at to deposit the chalk what was happening in the chemistry of the flood water or with the tectonics uh, that was affecting the chemistry of the flood water that caused all of these microorganisms to be sort of forming these extraordinary blooms these planktonic blooms that deposited the chalk at that particular point in in the flood record um, so there are all kinds of things that we could do to sort of be reinterpreting this this column from a, a creation perspective. You've been listening to Todd and Paul Talk Creation. If you'd like more information about any of the subjects discussed in the show, please visit us at coresci.org slash podcast. That's coresci.org slash podcast. If you'd like more information on sponsorship opportunities, or maybe you'd like to have a product or book reviewed or discussed on our podcast, please contact us at podcast at coresci.org. That's podcast at corsi.org. Let's take a moment now for a special message from our friends at Cornerstone Educational Supply. Cornerstone Educational Supply. 
supplies educational products for homeschoolers, educators, and individuals wanting to understand our world from a biblical young earth perspective. Cornerstone believes in providing great materials for hands-on learning, and they are offering listeners of the podcast 15% off all geology kits and supplies when you use the code PODCAST at checkout. Again, that's 15% off all geology kits and supplies when you use the code PODCAST at checkout. And remember, Cornerstone is science, faith, and fun. We love Cornerstone here at Let's Talk Creation. Okay, so let's go back to, you, you, you gave three examples there. Let me go back to the first one. You said the creationists generally agree that the Paleozoic and the Mesozoic were deposited by the flood. Okay, what what is that? <laughs> what, is, what does that mean? I knew I knew that was going to be the next question. You so knew what, good. You I hope you were yeah. thinking about it because I was thinking, all right, well, I don't know what that is. So help help so, me out here. So I've been kind of throwing these terms around: Paleozoic, Mesozoic, Cenozoic, and we need to kind of think about what these major. They're basically major divisions of the geological column, and we need to think what we mean by. So let me kind of briefly run through them, and we'll go, we'll go from the oldest, the, the ones at the base of the column, through, through to the ones at the top. So the oldest um, major division of the column is the Precambrian, and it has subdivisions that we don't need to think about here. But the Precambrian rocks are basically, uh, they're, they're mostly unfossiliferous, so they don't contain many fossils, or at least they contain only microfossils. Um, there are some... Uh, stromatolites, things called stromatolites, which are these mounds and columns of layered rock that appear to have been formed by the growth of sticky microbial mats that attract sediment and then you get another layer of growth and eventually they form these sort of laminated structures. You get some of those in the Precambrian. Um, at the very top of the Precambrian, there are uh, there's a community of very strange enigmatic organisms that we don't we don't even really know whether they're true animals or not called ediacarans they're these strange segmented and frond like animals uh, so that's kind of the precambrian and the sorts of fossils we find in it and those are the oldest rocks at the base of the column then we've got this thing this this division called the paleozoic and the paleozoic is where you get the first abundant fossils of marine invertebrates, so hard-bodied sort of shellfish, and get trilobites and, and uh, brachiopods and th things like that. Um, later on in the Paleozoic, you get a whole variety of fishes, including some strange armoured fishes, lots of extinct types that we don't have today. And then towards the top of the Paleozoic, we get the first appearance of uh, amphibians and, and reptiles. So that's the Paleozoic and the kinds of fossils you find. There. Then above that, you've got the Mesozoic, or Mesozoic. Um, and in the Mesozoic, um, the, this is where you find the dinosaurs. So we have uh, communities of fossil animals, often dominated by dinosaurs, but with other kinds of reptiles too. And you've got flying reptiles like pterosaurs, aquatic reptiles like plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs and mosasaurs. Um, Invertebrates like ammonites and bivalves, rather than trilobites and brachiopods, which you find in the Paleozoic. Uh, you do also find a few um, mammals and uh, flowering plants, but the um, and birds, but the, the the mammals and the birds they're they're kind of rare and they're not like modern groups of mammals. They're 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 different extinct. And then above the Mesozoic, we have the Cenozoic, which is the last sort of major division of the column. And in the Cenozoic, um, we have groups of more familiar animals. So we have fossils of birds and mammals, often representing groups that we're sort of familiar with, but also some extinct types. Uh, we get flowering plants. Uh, and uh, at the top of the Cenozoic, you get the first appearance of human fossils. So, so those are the kind of major division. So when we talk about the Paleozoic, we're talking about that particular group of geological systems that contain those kinds of fossils 
that are in that particular location within the geological column. Okay, so a couple of things I'm hearing here. You, you keep talking about this is older than that. Here's the first mm. appearance. Yeah. This sounds like evolution. Are you talking about, or at least, you know, radiometric dating, are you millions of years old? What does this mean? How, you, you must be, you must mean something else when you talk about that, or, or what, what is it that you're talking about there? Yeah, so as a creationist, you know, I reject the, uh, the, the radiometric dates as an absolute time scale. So I don't think that they're telling us exactly how old these rocks are in, in millions of years. Um, what I'm talking about, when I talk about older and younger, and I use these kinds of terms, I'm using them in a relative sense. So we know from, well, we can talk about the principles by which we know these things <laughs> in a moment, but we, we, can, we can deduce that some rocks were deposited before other rocks. So we know that some are relatively older and some are relatively younger, and uh, we can apply principles that have absolutely nothing to do with radiometric dates that allow us to deduce those things about those rocks. So we can work out a relative sequence. We call this relative dating. Um, and we can think about it completely independently of absolute dating, which is the attempt to actually put a time scale on how old this thing is and how young this thing is. All right. So... Yeah, so relative dating. So it basically is sort of going back to this notion that there is this ordered sequence of the layers, like a layer cake, yeah. where the bottom layers got to go down first before you can stack the layers up. It's really hard to make a layer cake from the top down because there's nothing to put the layer on, right? So. You, you have to put the bottom layer down first and then yeah. those on the top. Yeah, that's, ex that's exactly it. Okay. And this, this idea um, that the oldest layers are at the bottom and the youngest layers at the top has a, has a name. Geologists call it the principle of superposition. The principle of superposition. It, yeah. This is and that's typical all... science stuff where we have to give things <laughs> really complicated names. So. Yeah, and, and that's all it means. It just means the older stuff is at the bottom and the younger stuff is at the top. Well, that's, now, where, that's where, does this, where does this principle come from? Well, the, the first person really to formulate this principle was, was someone called Nicholas Stino um, oh. in the 17th century. He was, oh. uh, he was, he was actually a creationist, but he, he was studying rocks in Tuscany in Italy and, you know, he realized that rocks were, these sedimentary layers were originally deposited horizontally. Okay. Um, you know, gravi gravity does that, right? That makes, so, that makes so, these, sense. so these sediments are deposited as, as horizontal layers. And he realized, as a matter of just common sense, really, that, um, you know, one layer was laid down before the next layer on top, and then the right. next layer on top of that. Yeah. A bit like you build up a layer cake. And... Um, and, you know, this is not just uh, the principle of superposition, but there are other evidences that indicate that the sediment's built up in that order. So sometimes you find uh, a sedimentary rock which has grains or particles or pebbles of another rock layer contained within it. And you find that, that rock layer is found underneath the rock layer that contains the pebbles. Interesting. So it had to be there first for those pebbles to be eroded and then included in the layer above. So, you know, you can, you can work out the, the sequence. We, we know that there's this, this general sequence. And in fact, that's in a pile of layers which have been undisturbed, right? But you can even do it for layers which have been disturbed by folding and faulting, where it might not be quite so obvious, you know, what's the bottom and what's the top. But right. there, are ways, there are ways that geologists can... Uh, can deduce this. For example, there are things that geologists call way up structures. Way up structures. And way up all that, structures. Yeah, and all that means is that they're they're features of the sedimentary rocks that allow us to tell what's the top and what's the bottom. Which way is up? 
which way is up. <laughs> so they call so they call way up structures. Okay, so all right. Uh, so for I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, there's something called graded bedding. Okay. Graded bedding is where um, you have a, a layer of sediment which is deposited by a waning current, and so the coarsest particles are deposited at the bottom. And as the current wanes, the particles get smaller as you go up through the sedimentary layer. So you have a graded bed, the coarser stuff at the bottom, the finer stuff at the top. So if you find a sequence of graded beds, even if they were turned upside down in the field by earth movements, you could still work out which way was top and which way was bottom. Right? So, and, and this is just one of multiple examples of these kinds of way up structures in fact i have here i mean this is a very old textbook this is this is a textbook from 1948 by a geologist called um robert schrock and it the title of the book is sequence in layered rocks a study of features and structures useful for determining top and bottom or order of succession embedded and tabular rock bodies aha uh -huh. And it's a very use. I mean, it's an, it's a very old textbook, but it's a very useful textbook. But it is a whole book, all about how you work out the order in which sedimentary rocks were deposited. All right. How you work out what's top and what's bottom. So you know, we're we're not just kind of making uh, making this stuff up. You know, we're not just making right. we're not just guessing. Right. There are there are principles and features of the rocks that we can study. Principles that we can apply that allow us to um, deduce the sequence. And um, one other principle that I should mention, so we've, we've talked about um, superposition, oldest at the bottom, youngest at the top. We've talked about way up, how you tell what's top and what's bottom if the sediments have been disturbed. Another very important principle in this regard is what's called the principle of cross-cutting relationships. Now... Okay. <laughs> the principle of cross-cutting relationships is probably easiest to explain by using an example. So imagine you have a succession of layered sedimentary rocks, horizontal layered sediments. Okay. And then cutting vertically through this sequence of horizontal sediments is a, a sheet of igneous rock, a kind of vertical sheet of igneous rock formed by the injection of a molten magma. Oh, oh long, okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so along a Okay, so I've got layers and and it and it goes up through the layers. Yeah. That's basically what you say. It goes up through through the layers. Okay. So you you have the All horizontal right. layers and then you've got this vertical sheet of igneous rock that cuts through those sedimentary layers. Simple deduction which came first? The sedimentary layers or the igneous rock? Well, we know that the sedimentary the layers, layers had to come first, right? Yeah. Because the because thing goes squirting up in between them. Exactly. So, because the igneous rock cuts the sedimentary layers, we know that it had to come after the sedimentary layers. So, in effect, by applying these fairly simple principles, superposition, way up, cross-cutting relationships... By carefully observing these things in the field, we can work out the sequence of layers. We can say this is older than that. That's not to put a time on it to say, you know, this is 10 million years older than that. It's just that this is older than that. It yeah. might be five minutes yeah, old. Yeah, right. It could be minutes. Right? Yeah, exactly. Right. But it's older. Yeah. And that's that's what, what geologists are doing when they apply these principles of relative data. So even as creationists, even if we say this is not, you know, Cretaceous is not 65 million years ago or whatever, we still would say that's older than Cenozoic or yeah. the Permian is older than the Triassic just by virtue of <laughs> the fact that they occur in a certain ways and certain have these features that tell us this, this, is, this came before this one. Exactly. But it could be minutes. Yeah. It could be days. Yeah. It could we, be years, but it could yeah. be minutes. We don't days. know. We don't know. 
that's no. a, that's a separate sort of question. That's a separate question, and that's those numbers which geologists then assign to the rocks. They come from radiometric data. Right. But remember, right. radiometric dating. You know, radioactivity wasn't discovered until when 1896. Yeah, late. First. First radiometric dates were probably early 20th century, 1905, something like that. So the column was already put together between 1820 and 1850. So the column has nothing to do with the radiometric dates. The radiometric dates are you know, assigned to those rocks in the column, but it's an independent, it's a separate question. It's independent. Right. Right. Okay, we don't have to buy into the radiometric dates. Let's go back here. We were talking about creationist research into the, into the in the column we sort of touched on the idea of um, what parts of the column were caused by the flood and I think you brought up a really important issue and that is that how do you know how to recognize the end of the flood right because even in scripture we have the we have the grounding of the ark and then the release of various birds and then Noah can see the tops of mountains and then it finally dries up and then he finally gets off the ark so it's it's a long process even in scripture of of when the the flood ends so it makes sense then that people would not necessarily all see immediately oh well this is where the flood ends obviously um, because it doesn't end like that in the Bible, so why would I expect it to end like that in, in the fossil record? But and of course, when Noah, when Noah comes off the ark, we know that the ground was dry enough where he was for him right. to leave the ark. But actually, how do we know what was going on on the other side of the world at that point? We, we don't, don't know. Right? We don't know. We don't. So, so you know, like you say, the, the, the Bible implies that the end of the flood was a kind of gradual process. And in some respects, you could even argue that because the world is still in this process of recovery from the flood, in some sense, we're still suffering the effects, the after effects of, oh, of the flood, sure, yeah. even down to the present day. Yeah. Earthquakes so, and volcanoes yeah, and earthquakes. such like that. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's actually, I think, going to be quite a complex process of trying to pinpoint that and say we can drive the golden spike in here and say yeah. that's 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 the place that's in the record where, where, the, where the flood ends yeah so. yeah <laughs> right right so that yeah that makes a lot of sense to me um you also mentioned and and you were talking about the the uh, when i asked you about the the what are what is the paleozoic and mesozoic you you talked about these first appearances you talked about how, say, in the in the Precambrian, uh, you have fossils of things where you don't even know if it's a plant or an animal. It's just weird. It's super weird, and it's not much like anything that we have alive today. Whereas, uh, as we move up the record, it seems like things got more familiar. Um, you end up with birds, you end up with mammals up there, you end up with flowering plants. Uh, so that by the time you get to the very tippy top of the record, that's when you finally find human remains. Uh, that That's a pretty significant pattern. Um, so we've talked a little bit about patterns already. We've talked about the global pattern of the column itself, which seems to necessitate some sort of global explanation. We've talked about the the exceptions, which tend to be globally distributed in mountain ranges, um, which again suggests there is an ex explanation for why those exist, why those exceptions exist. And now you're saying that there is a... Are you saying there's an order in the fossil record that corresponds to the rock layers and that also needs an explanation is that right is that what i'm hearing yeah that that's what you're hearing so so there and and this goes back you know again to the observations of those very early field geologists in the 19th century that they recognized that superimposed on this sequence of rock layers they were studying were these fossil assemblages and they seem to appear in a con consistent predictable order you know wherever you found 
where have you found them? So, uh, so yeah, so there is this uh, kind of pattern of first appearances. But, I mean, let's think about that, the, the order of first appearances of major groups. So you take major groups like um, invertebrates, you know, they, they kind of appear earliest in the record, and you know, then, then you get the first uh, appearance of uh, fishes and th then you get amphibians and then you get reptiles and then you get mammals and birds and then you, then you get people broadly there's a kind of order there's a sequence there and um that order is real you know and it, it needs an explanation now the question is uh, can we explain it within the creation model the, the evolutionary model ever since the time of Darwin has tried to explain that pattern of first appearances in terms of evolution. Right? So you know, this is explained as the evolution, the order in which these groups have evolved over a time scale, you know, a very long time scale. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they appear in this order because they evolved in that order. That's, that's the order they appeared throughout Earth history. Um, now, when we look at the fossil order, and again, this is a, this, we, we can easily get into a lot of complexity here, but um, Kurt Wise did a very interesting um, study some years ago where uh, he said, you know, we can test whether the fossil order is explained well by evolution because we can construct evolutionary trees Right? We can construct phylogenies, evolutionary trees, for major groups based on their morphological similarities. Right? So how similar they are to one right. another. You can use that data to construct a branching diagram. And from the order of branching, you can predict here's the order in which these groups ought to have evolved if evolution is correct. That is an independent body of data from the fossil record. So you can then take that body of data, you can take those evolutionary trees, and you can then go to the fossil record and say, now let's see what order those groups actually appear in the fossil record. And do those two sets of data match? Because I think if evolution is true, if evolution is the explanation for the order in which we find the fossils you would expect there would be a pretty high degree of similarity between the or the predicted order from the evolutionary trees and what you see in the fossil record yeah probably and what, what probably you, really messy though but but i would yeah, imagine probably there, messy. Would be, there would be some correlation there yeah you you would think that you would see some some correlation now he he uh, did a study that focused on higher taxonomic groups Kingdoms, phyla, classes, orders, I think. And uh, he constructed, I think, about 140 evolutionary trees, you know, so he could compare them to the fossil record. And he found that in 95% of cases, uh, there was no statistically significant correlation between the predicted order of branching in the evolutionary trees and the... Uh, the fossil order. Actual fossil order. Wow. So that suggests that whatever that fossil order is, evolution might not be the best explanation for it. <laughs> you're, you're very gentle with that. 95% of the data doesn't agree with it. <laughs> Maybe that's not the best explanation. Yeah. yeah. So the question then is, what does the fossil order mean? And uh, in fact, what... Let, let me go back a step. So what does that fossil order mean? So one of the exceptions that Kurt found, so if you look at the 5% of his data where there was actually an agreement between the predicted evolutionary order and the fossil record, one of those groups were, were, was among plants. So hmm. Plants actually seem to show a pretty good correlation with the fossil record. So Kurt began to think about that a bit more, and he realized that, um, the, according to evolutionary theory, plants evolved in water. Right? They evolved in the water, and 
only later in their evolutionary history became Colonized independent land. of water and right. able to live and reproduce on land. Right. So there is this succession of fossil plants that are very water dependent at the bottom and they become gradually less de water dependent and more terrestrial as you go up the fossil sequence. And this is interpreted in an evolutionary way and it fits the kind of prediction from the evolutionary tree. But there is another explanation for that pattern, right? And that explanation is that what you're actually seeing is an ecological sequence, not an evolutionary sequence. So, so what maybe. Are you moving in from the shore, is that the idea? So you're starting off with plants which are living in very aquatic kind of environments and gradually moving towards plants that are becoming less, you know, more and more terrestrial. And he used that observation to develop this idea of the floating forest before the flood. Okay. Uh, there had been this huge biome of plants. It wasn't the only observation, you know, there were other things as well. He, you know, creationists were looking at the anatomy of the plants, um, you know, and, and realizing that the anatomy of some of these plants looked like they were plants that were floating on, on water. And, you know, there were other observations that kind of came in, but, um, but combining all of this information, he, he developed this idea of a floating forest whereby you had this mat of vegetation that was floating over the pre-flood ocean. And around the margins were those very water-dependent plants, basically plants that are aquatic. And as you move from the margins of the mat into the interior of the mat, the mat becomes much thicker and it's able to support larger plants and trees and... Uh, plants which are much more independent of standing water and that it was the successive burial, the breakup and burial of that pre-flood biome during the flood which produced the sequence of fossil plants that we now see. So it got broken up from the outside in, from the margins towards the centre. And this accounts for why the earliest plants you find are the ones that are living in water and then you as you move up through the sequence you eventually get to the ones that are much more uh, terrestrial so there's just an example of where we can begin to look at the the fossil occurrence data the order of fossil appearances and begin to develop alternative models for explaining it and the great thing about the floating forest model is that it actually explains a huge range of data. Uh, it was developed to explain that sequence of fossil plants, but it actually explains a whole load of other stuff as well. Um, so, you know, it has the hallmarks of a good explanatory, explanatory model. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. That's not like the kind of creationism that I think most people are used to hearing about. Um, that's a lot more creative. That's a lot more attentive to the larger, the larger patterns that exist. Well, we're out of time again. <laughs> again, um, I feel like we could keep talking about this. Why don't we? Uh, why gonna, don't we? We we we're gonna have to revisit it. Sometime, yeah, I'm, there, there are say, other things we could we could do. There's a lot more that could be said. Why don't we? Why don't we uh, reconsider uh, our subjects, right? And then maybe we can plan out some specific episodes. I'm sure listeners are thinking, well, what about this? Some of them, anyway. Um, yeah, let's let's try to deal with those in some of our future episodes. Um, and let's thank our listeners for listening. Uh, I appreciate your attentiveness. Um, if you'd like to know more information about our podcast, we are at coresi.org slash podcast. You can also find us, uh, you can email us at podcast at coresi.org. Um, we are on all the major podcasting platforms. If, you would, if you've enjoyed what you've been hearing, leave us a review. We'd appreciate that. We appreciate several of the reviews that we've already gotten. Uh, if you're listening or watching on YouTube, leave us a like or a dislike, whatever whatever floats your boat. Uh, and um, click the 
you know, subscribe button and the, the like button and the the button for the bell notification stuff, all that good stuff. Click all those buttons. Those are great buttons. Um, you can find out more about uh, my ministry, Core Academy of Science, at coresci.org. Paul, where we find out about yours? Yeah, it's biblicalcreationtrust.org. Great. Uh, yeah, and do keep your do keep your comments and questions coming in, and tell us what you'd like to hear more of on the podcast. Definitely. Um, yeah, we'd love to hear from you. And uh, both of our organizations, uh, we're co-sponsoring this. We would appreciate your support. If you're in the UK, uh, I believe there are all you are a registered charity, and they can we receive are, tax credits or something of that nature. Exactly. And even if you're outside the UK, um, we do have a PayPal account, so we're able to receive donations from overseas. Excellent. Excellent. Yes. And same for us. We can receive donations from anywhere. If you're in the US, we are a registered nonprofit, so you can receive a tax credit there. And we do definitely, we're basically donor driven, so we would very much appreciate your support. And for those of you who are supporting, thank you for making our work possible. Yeah. All right. I guess we'll be back in two weeks. I'm not sure what we're going to do. We're going to have to plan a replan again because this column conversation has just gone on longer than I expected. So, But that's great. I love it. I think I've learned some things, and I hope our listeners have too. So thanks for joining us. Bye for now. Take care. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Let's Talk Creation. If you have questions, send them to podcast at coresci.org. That's P-O-D-C-A-S-T at C-O-R-E-S-C-I dot org. And be sure to let your friends know about Let's Talk Creation. And check us out on social media. Thank you.